和艺术史的原创竞争理论。但是这些理理论，这个平台，它必须要与世界上啊最重要的艺术史学家展开对话的方式才能完成。众所周知，在艺术史研究当中，文艺复兴时期的艺术是最为关键的一个时期。啊，那么我们希望能够架设一个交流的平台，通过邀请。国际上在文艺复兴研究当中最为重要的学者，来到这里来发表和分享他们的观点，跟我们产生真正的对话，以此呢，来带动整个中国的艺术学和图像理论的发展。这就是我们一个简单的一个一个意图。我们将在这个平台不断的去组织和邀请更多的专家和学者来展开讲座和工作坊活动，也希望大家能够继续关注我们这个系列。在讲座之前，我们先请朱兴生教授来做，呃，物理系教授的讲座的一个导语，大家欢迎。呃，朱老师的呃这个导语呢是用中文进行。谢谢杨老师。我们之所以用中文进行，是是因为在人在听，他们大多数是中国的。呃，中文听众，他们呃就会呃更想了解我们为什么要做这件事情。本来呢，我的这个讲话呢也是有一个英文的字幕，但是呢，由于我们前一段时间啊这个工作的原因，有一点点紧张。大家知道，今天是北京大学开开学的第二天，而在上海外国语大学。还没开学呢，呃，他们马上就要接待教授，而这一次接待教授竟然是在假期中间接待教授，所以呢，这个都是因为我们考虑到有机会在网络上有更多的这个中中国的呃听众参加，所以我们这个就做这儿，包括李阳老师做介绍的时候，我做这个音。年的时候啊，都用中文来进行，而我们的材料都已经是事先给到教授。好，国家艺术史中央研究所的所长沃克西教授来给中国的学界进行讲讲演，他将会给中国的学者和听众带来三次讲座。其中有两次是开放的，我们将会用直播的方式在多个平台来进行播出。过去我们已经进行过三讲，每一次最少有两万人，最多有三万人在听讲。就后来还有后继的这个重复播播放还不在此列。就学术讲座，并不是。普及性的讲座，因为我们在中国也有很多普及性的讲座，就是面对大众的。但是我们这个不是，对，这个是对文艺复兴以及前后的一些重要问题的最新研究和最重要的研究成果的发表，有些都是首次发表，因为讲座是以外国语来进行的。呃，即使是使用英语，也涉及到复杂的术语和其他语言。因为文艺复兴本身研究的对象就是意大利语，所以它是经常有很多的意大利语。更何况还有很多古代语言的材料和引证。所以的话呢，呃，我们就准备了。中英文的字幕，就是这个到他正式讲座的时候有中英文的字幕。这些字幕是由外国语专业的专家和艺术史的专家，他们合作来完成的。他们不仅翻译，而且推敲术语，甚至有些部分还要跟教授互相互相之间去讨论和核对，就是。那么这样的一种工作。因为在表述术语的时候会附加原文，所以你还可以自己直接看到的英文的表述。这样的学术质量是同声传译不能够呃达到的。
这个方法也是北京二零一六年世界艺术史大会所采取的一个有效的方法。当时有四百多个讲座，无论演讲者使用哪种语言，在他的这个讲演的旁边都会有英文和中文。后来我们把这个变成一个制度，就是一边是英文，一边就是所在国的母语，就是他是在哪个国家办，他就有哪个国家的母语。这个目的也是为了和当地的学者和普通的学学术的关心者获得一个友好的联系，他们都可以来听这样的讲座，听众。通过字幕得以充分的了解讲者的观点和他们的研究成果，因此我们要特别感谢工作团队，包括北京大学、上海外国语大学、中国美院和鲁迅美院的团队的辛勤劳动。当然，教授还会在中国美院这次举行一个闭门的呃这个工作坊，而工作坊。他们之间只直接用英文进行的，就没有这些前期的工作了。他们主要是在一起交流和讨论。这次德国艺术史的这个中央研究院所带来的讲座，对我个人来说呢，就特别有意义，使我想起了我自己当年在大学教了五年书以后，就被北京大学。派到德国去进修。一九九零年的六月七号的下午，我就到达了海德堡，从法兰克福到达海德堡。我当时就进了教室，听了第一堂课。课后，我的老师，如他 l i t t l e h o l d e r 他就把我带到了海德堡的大学广场。海德堡的大学广场呢，有一个书店，它的名字就叫大学书店 b u c h h a n d l u m d e r Universität）。我就带到这个书店，他就买了两本书送给我。这两本书就是教授所在的这个研究所召开的一次大会留下来的文本。这个文本呢，一本呢，它是它不是他们的人做的。是他们组织全德国最重要的呃艺术史家在一起做的，可能大家还会听到有些人的名字会很熟悉，比如说 Hans b e l t i n g 比如说 Martin w a n k e r 呃这些人，他们都是参加这个会议来做这个报告的。他们做了个报告呢，报告就被集起来，就在一九八三年呢，就出了一本书，叫做《艺术史导论》。叫 Kunstgeschichte einer Einführung， 就是就有这么一一本书。另外呢，五年以后，他们又出了第二本。这一本呢，是因为他们的报告做完以后，就有很多的人提出了质疑和问题，于是他们就决定再请一批著名的教授来对这样的事情进行一个补充和反应，就是别人有疑问，他就要反应。所以这本书呢，呃，就是到底什么是艺术史？它叫《Kunstgeschichte》，Aber V 就这两本书。这两本书出开，教授买了这两本书，我的教授他就把他送给了我，他把我我头头一天去，他就送给了我。这两本书呢，就开启了我进一步学习呃艺术史的一个经历。后来我在不止一位的教授们的桌上都看到了这两本书，因为这两本书是是 paper paper cover。就是很流行，在德国很流行，几乎教授们人手一册，就人手两册，各有一册，一本黄颜色，一本白颜色。哎，那么我就意识到这两本书啊，它不仅是对当时的或者在这个之前的艺术史的学科的总结，而且是当时一般的作为艺术史教学的一个呃这个根据，一个权威根据和依据。现在，这个第一本书呢，已经被翻译成了中文。译者就是刚才李阳老师介绍的贺寻博士，他翻了第一本书。第二本书呢，则是在上海外国语大学的世界艺术史研究所在翻译，那么快要出版了。
已经进入了最后的呃这个呃叫编辑阶段。这两本书的出版翻译将会对中国的艺术史界研究有所注意。那么大家可能会问，我自己在三十年前就回国了，为什么我自己没有翻译这两本书呢？其实这个底下还有另外两个原因。第一个原因是我自己完成博士学位是一九九五年，九五年大家可能年轻的学生没有没有没有概念这是什么概念，这是什么意思？九五年实际上就是互联网的元年，也就是说九五年之前没有互联网，九五年之后就有互联网。那么有互联网以后，其实学界和学术的技术发生了根本性的转变。我刚才和 Martin Powers 教授在说，我说我们这一代人是在没有改变之前完成了全部教育，就是完成博士学位，就是完成了全部教育。我们是转变之前的那一代，我们是转变之前的最后一代。实际上，艺术史的研究技术，随着互联网的通用，随着数字人文的出现，随着计算机扫描技术、这些图像技术的开始，我们已经改变了这个艺术史的技术。当时我就感觉到了这个改变，所以我觉得必须再一次反思艺术史方法论的时刻到了。于是我回国以后，立即就建立了北京大学的汉化研究所。一九九五年，对，然后呢，我们就着手建设图像、文献和实物的数据库，并且建立图像系呃这个索引系统，就是图像索引系统。所以我们编辑了《汉化总录》，我也很开心的告诉大家，就在今年春节过年前几天。呃，我得到了消息，就是我们编到现在的《汉化总录》已经获得了国家的这个人文社会科学的最高奖，我很高兴，就是告诉大家这么个好消息。那个时候我们就开始做这个事情，那么同时呢，我们在做这个事情的时候就重新开始思考，什么是图像的最新理论，就是说在图像时代，在有计算机的情况之下。我们怎么来做图像？我们怎么来理解图像？当然，我们的前面会有德国 w a r b u r g 这个系统，在美国也有 Michel 这个系统，他是这个呃 Martin 的好朋友，我们还一起在中国在北大开过课，我也跟他认识很多年。但是我们的这一套理论，实际上跟美国的理论和德国的理论完全不一样。我们是依赖我们的一个完整的这个图像的数据库来进行的，所以我们希望现在应该重新讨论什么是艺术史，这就是我当时啊的心态。第二个原因，艺术史是一个德语学界率先建立起来的特殊学问。我记得。在九十年代末期，我到美国去的时候，美国的艺术史家告诉我，他们的第一外语是德语，但是现在已经不是这样。现在全世界艺术史家的第一外语都是英语。呃，现在这个情况变化是在二零零零年以后。好，这是一个德国建立起来的学问，其方法基本上依据于希腊和基督教渊源的观念和德国的思辨方法，但是这种方法。却解决不了中国艺术的问题，如书法的问题和写意绘画的问题。虽然我自己接受了严格的德语系统的艺术史训练，后来我得到北京大学的呃同意，就是允许我在德国呃连续在那呃就是呃请假，就是完成这个博士学位。所以我在德国实际上待了连续待了五五年半。所以我是接受了完整的德语系统的艺术史训练，但是还是意识到，其实，在不同的文化和不同的时代中，存在着不同的艺术和艺术史。所以，在我回国二十年以后的二零一六年，终于有机会由我的同事和我
，我担任主持，召开了世界艺术史大会，就是国际艺术史学会的第三三十四届世界艺术史大会，主题就是 terms， 说的就是不同的文化和不同的时代，艺术和艺术史是不一样的。这次大会也促成了国际艺术史学会学刊的恢复 c h a j o u r n a l 已经恢复了，而它的总标题依旧沿用了北京会议的主题，叫 Terms，T E R M S， 就是。之所以大家要讨论 Terms 这个问题，并不仅仅是为了反对欧洲中心主义或者西方中心主义。而是要让全世界不同的文化表达不同的意见，共同来讨论什么是艺术史的问题，同时要在新媒体时代，就是所谓的图像时代，重新来讨论艺术史的价值和作用，重新认识图像是如如何的脱离了物质，脱离了存在。脱离了真理，而变成我们一种特殊的现实。今天的现实或者将要有的现实是 visual reality， 不是那个所谓的真理和物质的现实了。那么，这已经成为人类的共识，是我们人类共同碰到的新的困难。而这一点，我很高兴，我和呃 w o r k i s 教授立即就取得了共识。当我见到他的时候。我们做了很好的沟通，我们就一起做了一个共同的决定，就是我们真的需要再来开一次世界艺术史的方法论大会。本来我们希望在慕尼黑开会，这个四十周年以后的二零二三年就开这个会，但是由于疫情的影响，使得我们所有的事情都延期了，所以我跟。呃，沃克斯教授做了一个决定，准备把这个会议在二零二六年来开。我们认为这个会议的组织方法就是要用不同文化和不同语言的学者来对同一个问题来发言，让他最后完成这样的一本书。我希望这样的一本书也是，呃，有一本是他的陈述，有一本是对他的质疑。对我个人来说，我觉得我在这里开启的。不仅是沃克斯教授今天的讲座，而是关于四十年前这一位他现在负的职务。四十年前他的前任就在负责这个艺术史方法论的大会，他是一个重要的机构的领导。我们在启动下一个世界艺术史方法论的会议，我们今天是在做这个会议，由他给我们呈现。和讲述到底什么是艺术史，和艺术史到底发生了如何？谢谢大家，大家准备。嗯，啊，谢谢朱老师的致辞，也把我们这次活动的意义，呃，说好了。那么接下来我们就有请。呃，乌里奇教授来做他的演讲，主题演讲，我们掌声欢迎乌里奇。谢谢Dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited to be able to present my ideas to this audience and then to discuss it with you. Many thanks to the organizers and many thanks for the kind introduction and I'm already looking forward to our joint conference in 2026. I very much hope that my lecture on the relation between scholarship and work on the one hand and recreation of the mind and body on the other in the Renaissance will be of interest in Beijing as an old center of scholarship and collecting precious art. The humanists of the Renaissance were serious people. Their studioli 
the studies, collection rooms, and libraries were places of important and erudite scholarship, hard work, virtue, and the pursuit of fame. And I show you what is most probably the oldest representation of a humanist in his study, even if overpainted Petrarch in Padua, late 14th century. At least this is the impression of hard work, serious people, one gets today when looking at Renaissance depictions of humanists and other important persons in their workspace, or when visiting the preserved studies and collection rooms in Italian cities, or even more so when consulting the modern scholarly literature on this topic. The study rooms of the humanists indeed seem to be the heart of Renaissance culture in Europe. This is where the pioneering thoughts and writings were born and where ancient artifacts and modern works of art in the style of antiquity were collected and displayed. The study rooms emerged in 14th century architecture in France and Italy with the beginning of humanism. At the Italian courts, they became increasingly important and sumptuous representation rooms. Examples of the late 15th century have been preserved in the palaces of Urbino and of Mantova, with the study and collection rooms of the Montefeltro family and of Isabella d'Este. Then the studies reached their zenith in the 16th century in the Palazzo della Signoria. Francesco Primo set up his studiolo in 1570-72, directly next to the Sala dei Cinquecento. So this is the study, and you enter the study room here. So the study is uh, uh, next to the Sala dei Cinquecento, the largest reception room and throne room of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. The pictorial program of this study depicts the entire cosmos from the cave of nature and eternity on the ceiling emerge all the objects in this world, which are depicted and arranged, sorry, and arranged according to the four elements on the four side walls and even stored in cabinets behind the paintings. Whereas Francesco the Primo governs his territory, Tuscany, in the large hall next door, he symbolically becomes the ruler of all of nature and the whole cosmos in his study next door. It is hard to evoke and concentrate more meaningfulness in such a small room. Over the next few decades, the most important rulers would build even larger spaces for their universal collections. The galleries then became the successors of the studies. Galileo Galilei, will confirm this in a famous letter at the beginning of the 17th century. Instead of small rooms, large halls should be set up in which the cosmos can be presented in an orderly fashion. However, none of this changes the underlying observation. In these studies and collection rooms, the knowledge, thinking, and power of the Renaissance was produced and exhibited. If this would be the whole story, I could stop my lecture right here. Because the history of Renaissance studies in collection rooms has been well researched. However, this research does not provide an answer to a number of irritating observations. There were obviously many surprising objects in the studies in collection rooms that cannot simply be explained by study and science. Indeed, we are seemingly faced with a veritable cabinet of curiosities in search for understanding and explanation. Moreover, there are reports that people sang, laughed, and relaxed in the study rooms. Apparently, it was not only important to work intensively there, but also to enjoy. The concept of recreation Otium is the Latin term for it, was intensively discussed by the humanists. But it has not really been taken seriously by art history. 
So what I want to show today is that the studies and collection rooms of the Renaissance were also places of recreation, of pleasure, and destruction. My aim is to demonstrate that the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy were not only a renaissance of antiquity and of humanist studies, but also a renaissance of the idea that people needed leisure and relaxation. Or to put it differently, the studies in collection rooms were spaces for the work-life balance of the Renaissance. I will proceed in three chapters. The first deals with the irritations of previous ideas about the study in collection rooms of the Renaissance. The second chapter with demands and dangers of the study and the third was pleasure and recreation in the study. The first chapter, irritations. The irritation begins when you take a closer look at some of the portraits showing people at their desks and in their studies. For example, Lorenzo Lotto around 1530 depicts a young man with a large business book in front of him. Letters, a signet ring, and a chain lie next to him on the table, keys are placed behind him, and an inkwell stands next to him. Surely an important person, despite of his young age. But what is the life-size bronze lizard in front of him on the table for? And I show you a preserved, in this case, silver lizard in Nuremberg, just to demonstrate that these are real objects of the 16th century. A similar irritation characterizes the portrait of Bernardino Corio, author of A History of Milan from 1503, a portrait printed in the first pages of this book. The woodcut shows the scholar in his study, in his best cloth, working at his desk. The inscriptions not only confirm that he surpassed the ancient historians of Rome and that his posthumous fame will be eternal. The two mottos also commit him to truth and virtue, so qualities we would expect for a serious scholar in the Renaissance. Even his little dog in the foreground obeys to this idea. The name is Apatis. The name Apatis refers to a basic characteristic of ancient Stoic philosophy of life, apatheia, or dispassion towards all twists and turns of fate. In other words, it seems at first sight that the humanistic ideal is about reason and virtue, and that all emotions and momentary desires are completely controlled by them. However, it is surprising that these extremely important qualities are embodied by the lap dog. One wonders if this dog apatheia or dispassion could also have a second different meaning in this case. The dog just lays around lazily whole day, does not let itself be disturbed by anything. Apatia would then also be meant ironically. And this irritation even becomes more disturbing when two pages later you encounter another woodcut in Corio's History of Milan, which now promises the rewards of the author's labor in his study, eternal virtue, but embodied by half-naked, erotically attractive female figures. This strange ambivalence between virtue, erudition, fame on the one hand, relaxation, animals, erotic female figures, and other seemingly insignificant objects on the other seems to be decisive for most of the small scale sculptures and objects that were almost certainly placed in the studies and libraries of the humanists, sculptures and objects which have survived in large quantity and therefore must have been very common. Besides statues depicting virtuous men and women from antiquity, heroic deeds and symbols of the taming of the passions, we are confronted with a curiosity cabinet, countless animals, from snakes and toads to fantasy creatures. We find depictions of children playing, 
and there is a variety of erotic representations from naked women to outright pornographic scenes. For all these topics, it seems impossible to understand why they might have what they might have to do with virtue, humanistic studies, and the strife for glory. And yet, they were in the study rooms. It should also be emphasized that these objects were not just cheap knickknacks. Some of them were extremely elaborate, high-quality, precious works of art. So my paper asks how these small-scale objects, statuettes, inkstands, lamps, etc., all different from each other, but all not serious objects in our modern understanding, can be explained in the studies and collection rooms of humanists. What meaning and function did they have? What should become evident at the end of my talk is that relaxing in the studio with these objects was as important as virtue, hard work, and fame. Second chapter, demands and dangers of the study. Very few statements from the 15th and 16th century are known regarding how small-scale objects in the study were perceived and dealt with. Dora Thornton compiled most of them in her 1998 book, The Scholar in His Study. Not a single source goes beyond a description of an individual object or beyond list, listing of objects in an inventory. No, not a single source goes beyond this to a more general analysis of the function of the demands made by such an object. For some of these pieces, it is evident that they exert, exhort virtue, demonstrate scholarship, and express hope for eternal fame. Dora Thornton's second brilliant book, co-authored with Luke Sison, discussed discusses these objects of virtue. But in this publica publication, too, everything is directed towards virtue, the rational, fame, and artistic quality. Relaxing in the studio and other possible functions of these objects do not play a decisive role. The starting point for any understanding of objects in a Renaissance collection is that the pieces were intended not only as ornament of the studies and collection rooms, but as a kickoff for reflection and conversation. The first modern The first modern treatise on the visual arts, which was printed, a book on sculpture, the Scultura by Pomponius Gauricus, famously begins with such a meeting in a study. The humanist Raphael Regius visits the author Gauricus. Both look at sculptures in the room with the images, as Gauricus calls his workspace. From this, following the model of Cicero's dialogues, their book-length conversation about sculpture takes its beginning. This example can be generalized. All objects in the studies and collection rooms were not simply intended to be looked at in silence, but, to be the, but they should be the occasion for conversation and discussion, whether scholarly or er and erudite or witty and relaxing. That such, such conversations could not only be developed around individual, isolated objects, but that several objects in a collection were intentionally grouped together and arranged in a meaningful way might seem obvious, but it has thus far hardly been demonstrated, because all original arrangements in Renaissance studies have been undone over time. However, the antiquarian botanist and collector Ulisse Aldrovandi described such a spatial situation in detail in his guidebook to the Antiquities of Rome of 1556. In the house of the Cardinal of Carpi, Aldrovandi visited several studies and collection rooms. In the second of these rooms, entirely linked with green velvet, he encounters particular sta staging, and I quote, on the table 
of this studiolo, which was completely covered with green velvet cloth. There's a statuette of a fawn and a portrait of Socrates in marble, famous for its rarity and artistry. Both objects uh, have been lost, so I show you similar objects to, to give you a visual impression. Next to these two objects is placed a metal vessel decorated with children in low relief who are fishing and doing other activities, a very rare thing which carries an hourglass with columns and a golden ring, unquote. First of all, the color green is supposed to calm and exhilarate the senses and the spirit. This widespread notion was noted, for example, by Fulvio Pellegrino in his treatise on the meaning of colors, first published in print in 1535. The entire green decoration of the study was thus intended to dampen tensions, emotions, and stress. The central message of the room, which contained other ancient sculptures, is developed on the table in the middle. The bust of Socrates next to the statuette of a faun refers to an idea of Plato and others that Socrates' face and appearance, reminiscent of these natural creatures, of these ugly and natural creatures, was in marked contrast to his beautiful soul. The combination of the ancient bust of Socrates and the statuette of the faun thus makes a claim about the difference between body and spirit, that contrary to popular belief, a beautiful soul is not necessarily to be found in a beautiful external form. The third object on the table was apparently an ancient metal jug or cup on which a rotes, amores, little boys, fish, and otherwise enjoy themselves. The specific vessel is not known. I show you an example today in Berlin with a fishing scene, and I apologize for the bad image, but I've just recently discovered this rare uh, uh, piece. And uh, as a second example, a silver cup in Naples, however, with a horse race of boys. A Renaissance hourglass was mounted on the piece Al Romandi described. The combination of children playing and time running out had to be perceived as a memento mori, a reminder to use one's lifetime as well as possible and not to waste it. On the table in the Cardinal of Carpi's collection, the emblematic combination of objects propagated a life of virtue and spirit. All this seems only to confirm once again what I have stated in my introduction, the workrooms and libraries of the humanists were places of scholarship, labor virtue, and the pursuit of glory. Nonetheless, the seriousness of these spaces was associated with a great danger, melancholy. When scholars are exclusively working, they could become melancholic, listless, and ill. The new ideas are missing, production stops. This danger was so great that already in 1489, Marsilio Ficino published his De Libri Vita Tres, a very successful treatise on how a scholar should keep mind and body healthy and productive. Many other writings of this kind followed. For example, in 1556, the same year, as Aldrovandi's guidebook to Roman antiquities appeared, Filippo Caponi published an entire volume, 200 pages plus, in which he gives advice on how to increase creativity and what to do against the writer's block, against unwillingness to work and lack of creativity. This book is even more spectacular insofar that Caponi based his advice on a survey among contemporary artists, musicians, and writers, including Michelangelo and Titian. 
Even if Capone's concrete advices sound strange to us, he gives the advice of holding the pen not like this, but to change the finger and to put it on the third finger to increase the blood flow and thus the creativity. Even if Capone's concrete advices after 200 pages of analysis sound strange to us, his general concern is very understandable. Variety, change, and free time contribute to creativity and well-being. What has not been emphatically emphasized is that the furnishing of the studies, workrooms, and libraries of the humanists with paintings and sculptures could serve to dispel the melancholy of a scholar by offering exactly this kind of variety and change to the eyes. All the distracting images and all the impulses for fantasy and emotions they evoke were meant to dispel potential melancholy and to help to overcome lack of ideas and creative force. The stimulus from the images could be provided in different ways. There were also serious objects that could give an impetus for writing or have an inspirational effect. And of course, the distracting ones. These are the serious are, so to speak, the positive representations of the activity that should be carried out in the studies. I discuss and present three examples of this. Above all, however, I will then try to show that there were also numerous other curious images and objects, which are still much more difficult to interpret today, that were intended to have an effect when inspiration had already turned into melancholy. It is central to realize that in the studies and collections, there were two categories of objects as a positive incentive and objects as a remedy. One of the earliest small bronzes of the Renaissance belongs to the group of objects as an incentive. The statuette was probably modeled and signed around 1481-82 by Bertoldo di Giovanni, Donatello's pupil in Florence, and later Michelangelo's teacher. It depicts the ancient hero Bellerophon trying to restrain Pegasus. As Bellerophon wants to ride Pegasus to Mount Olympus and fails, He's seen as a symbol of human overconfidence. However, the horse Pegasus also opened the fountain of the muses on Mount Parnassus with his hoof and released the stream of inspiration. In this respect, the winged horse also stands for all kinds of inspiration in writing. What we see could presumably also be understood to mean that working at the desk is like the efforts of Bellerophon. Every author must acquire inspiration, the Pegasus. At the same time, this must not lead to arrogance, otherwise every project will fail. Bellerophon was therefore unable to write to Mount Olympus. The statuette on the desk is therefore both an incentive and a warning. The second small-scale statue I want to present, presumably of an Orpheus by the Paduan sculptor Andrea Riccio from 1520-25, is another example of such images between incentive and warning. In antiquity, Orpheus is the epitome of the perfect poet and singer. Leaning forward, hat to one side, an open mouth, Orpheus is in the very act of inspired creation. The richness of his song is symbolized by the cornucopia on his side. His singing even calmed the wild animals and the gods of the underworld. The hole you can see on the at the back of Orpheus' seat was probably an attachment point to secure the statuette to a wall mounted above a Renaissance scholar's desk. Orpheus could have inspired equally rapt episodes of contemplation and writing. But Orpheus also fails, failed later in his life. He was murdered because he could not control his emotions. And finally, third example, there were numerous inkwells in Italy, but also north of the Alps, on which naked women are represented. 
These erotic images show a wide range of nymph female satires, personifications, and muses. The erotic attraction of all these figures exert to look at them closely or even to touch and hold them is under this erotic, uh, this erotic attraction is understood in the Renaissance as a symbol of creative power. The muse is inspiring her lover, the author. The muse's kiss, an idea that does not exist in antiquity and was invented at the end of the 15th century, gives every humanist the motivation to write. As surprising as it may seem to us today, erotic inspiration is a central and serious concept of the Renaissance. However, there are also numerous references to a much less scholarly perception. Naked women's bodies could also be used for sensual pleasure, distracting and lewd jokes by men. A small enigmatic painting by Lorenzo Lotto from 1545-49 explicitly depicts this reversal of meaning. Again, we see Mount Parnassus. The god Apollo has fallen asleep in the shade of the trees. As soon as their god and master is no longer paying attention, the muses have shed off their clothes and attributes. You can see here the nine piles of cloths and attributes of the muses. They shed off their clothes and attributes <clears throat> and now leap naked down the mountain. The unusual depiction aims to show that the arts cannot always be produced under the control of Apollo, that is, a superior rational spirit. There must also be moments of relaxation and variety. One cannot always be on the summit of Parnassus, but must sometimes also descend into the valleys, so to speak. The only known text to date that describes Apollo falling asleep and the muses undressing and running away comes from the poet Pacifico Massimo. This Pacifico Massimo was known for his erotic uh, poetry. He points out that not every poet can only deal with the most important and highest topics, but that one can also write about lower uh, themes. This duality was always present in the study rooms of the Renaissance. After my three examples of incentive, I will now proceed to objects which were intended to act as a remedy and cure for melancholy by providing pleasure and relaxation for the humanists. The third chapter, pleasure and recreation in the study. The most detailed guidance on how to avoid the danger of melancholy in scholars was provided by Costanzo Landi in 1557 with his method of keeping in good health. Landi not only recommends lighter reading from time to time, such as Petrarch's love poems or else music, he further spells out, and I quote, joy and destruction are produced by hunting, fishing, looking at rushing streams, the chirping of crickets, flower meadows, observing small animals such as bees or ants and the like, because the mind delights in recognizing order and discipline in these small bodies, in painting and sculpture, which also contribute to giving rest to the eyes. Thus, Suetonius reports that even Emperor Augustus took special delight in precious Corinthian tableware, unquote. Landi's text provides all the elements necessary to interpret our enigmatic sculptures and objects in the humanist's study in terms of pleasure and recreation. The little boy's fishing as described by Aldrovandi on the ancient vessel serving as a base of an hourglass, was then have been understood not only as a reference to the transcience of time and life, rather, they would also have distracted viewers 
reminding them of moments of joy and relaxation and helping them not to become exclusively focused in work and as a result to become melancholic. For the same reason, Andrea Mantegna had painted a picture of dancing children now lost with the title Melancholia. I show you a preserved example from a German Renaissance painter which had the same intention to dispel melancholy by looking at cheerfully playing children. The medical ideas invoked here go back to Hippocrates and Galen and were very common since the late Middle Ages. Accordingly, a person's health was based, among other things, on six external non-natural factors, such as air, food and drink, exercise, and the balanced state of the emotions. For this balanced state of emotions, relaxation was already recommended in the late Middle Ages. Music, time spent in nature, and exhilarating literature were considered helpful. But it was not until the 15th century that looking at pictures and beautiful decorations seem to have been added to the list of these recreations. In fact, the two most successful health treaties of the 15th century by Benedetto Reguardanti and Ugo Benzi, in these two treatises, the new interest in recreation and the astonishing range of pursuits reads, read thus, and I quote, for the preservation of health, we should strive most resolutely for moderate pleasures and for gladdening solaces, so that as much as possible, we may live happily in temperate gaiety. And further, there should be the most diligent effort made to instill liveliness and good hope in the scholar and to shift his thoughts on one day to some delight. Of preparing houses, pleasure gardens, and estates, and other similar activities. Unquote. These considerations were emphatically taken up by the humanists. For example, when Guarino da Verona, around the mid 15th century, arguably describes a clay inkwell depicting children climbing a tree, this provides the opportunity for rhetorical demonstration of ekphrasis for describing. Guarino could show that he knows the ancient criteria for convincing imitation and for works of art that seem alive. In all of this, however, the fact that the sight of children's games and childlike emotions exhilarates the viewer's mood always plays a crucial role. The medical advice on pleasure and recreation as an antidote to melancholy seems to be directly implemented here. And I quote, it often happens that I cannot have enough of the pleasure I find in examining the little figures and the living faces in the clay. When I look at an open mouth, I expect a voice to come from the dump. When I see the putty hanging from the tree, I forget that they are made of earth, and I fear that they may fall and injure their small bodies, and I cry out in pity. As childhood and changeable souls, make for varied feelings of the soul. So here you see varied expressions on their faces. One is grinning, another is a little sad. This one is carefree, that one meditative. And here too are postures immodest through the wantonness of childhood for parts of the body which should in natural prudence be hidden are here impudently exposed to view." Unquote. And I, sh uh, because the Inkwell uh, Guarida describes uh, seem to be lost. I show you another one from and by Andrea Richo, who is formerly was in Berlin, and you might have <clears throat> discovered the cricket here. So it's uh, almost the same situation. 
Continuing with Lundy's list of pleasing things, one also finds there the chirping of crickets and the watching of little animals like bees or ants and the like as antidotes to melancholy. A table centerpiece like that of Andrea Riccio, formerly in Berlin, now in Moscow, shows a little boy climbing a tree to catch a cricket. But all the other small animals from Riccio's workshop you have seen can also be understood as recreational distractions in the studio in the sense of Constanzo Landi. Finally, Pliny reports in his Natural History that the Roman painter Antiphilus painted amusing ideas for pictures, grilloi, for relaxation. Such witty inventions also seem to be an integral part of the pictorial equipment in the workrooms. But Pliny also mentions another possibility of relaxation. The painter Parasius had enjoyed himself in his spare time by making little pictures with erotic scenes. Now, Costanzo Landi does explicitly emphasize that the scholar should avoid anything erotic. He then explains, however, that we are all like pans, fawns, and satires because our mind controls the upper half of our body, while the lower half of the body is guided by urges and lusts. The countless statuettes with creatures of nature seem to represent exactly this idea, the you know, double nature of our body, especially since relaxation through erotic fantasies not only combats melancholy, but the erotic inspiration by the muses was understood as a decisive positive stimulus for creativity and for literary production. In Bernardino Corio, to return to the starting point of my reflection, the reward of virtuous living and work, and work can therefore appear as an eroticized female figure. A few Renaissance texts explicitly describe the interpretation developed here for the study rooms, and in some cases go even further. Not only the mind, but actually the whole body finds rest and is healed in these rooms. It is worth recalling Girolamo Garimberto, the advisor of Cardinal Alessandro Farnese in Rome, who recommended to the Cardinal, and I quote, it would greatly enhance your camerini, your small rooms in the Cancelleria, his, pal his palace in Rome, if you made a study with all your small objects, such as metals, cameos, inkstands, and clocks. So by gathering together an ensemble of some many gems and objects of extraordinary beauty and richness, you will give pleasure to yourself regularly and on, to others on occasion, besides serving as an antidote to all your worries." Unquote. The central part the purpose of the collection here is to serve as a remedy for all worries through variety and pleasure. The hopes of Piero de' Medici in Florence went even further. The sources of the 15th century report that the city lord of Florence sought out his collection in the hope of finding relief from his gout. Thus, the restorative effect of the collection here was not to be limited to the mind, but to serve the whole body. To conclude, virtue, scholarship, and the pursuit of fame are central factors of a humanist lifestyle. These themes are evoked in various ways in the pictorial decoration of the workrooms, libraries, and collections of the 15th and 16th century. However, with this emphasis, on spirit, will, and self-control comes a great danger, namely becoming melancholic and unproductive as a result of this continuous effort. As a corrective, therefore, moments of relaxation of joy and the expression of emotions are deliberately called for. The themes and forms of this relaxation are described most extensively by Costanzo Landi in 1557, with reference to painting and sculpture. It is clear 
that this captures very well the surprisingly broad spectrum of small sculptures and objects of the Renaissance, from ancient heroes and virtuous deeds to small animals to grotesque comic compositions and erotic scenes. In pictorial form, Lorenzo Lotto summarizes the consideration pursued here. Lotto portrays Andrea Odoni, a Venetian, in his collection in 1527. Odoni is not only captured by his love for his objects, if you look at his, as indicated by the hand on his chest, but also the fragmented statue, statuette of Venus, the goddess of love, next to the bearded male head in the foreground, indicates this love for his collection. And in this collection, Odoni also moves between the poles of virtue and relaxation. In the background on the left, a statue of Hercules can be seen strangling the giant Antheus in midair. In the background on the right, on the other hand, another naked female figure and a peeing Hercules are placed. Here I put uh, the ancient example for this type next uh, to the painting. This marks this movement from Hercules, uh, uh, the virtuous Hercules to the being Hercules. This marks the entire range of behavior using the figure of the ancient hero par excellence as an example. I hope my attempt was successful in showing that small scale objects and sculptures in the scholar's study can only really be understood if one takes the work-life balance as a serious issue already for the Renaissance. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, 呃，非常呃，感谢啊，吴立西教授一个非常有趣的一个选题啊，讲述了呃文艺复兴时期人文主义者书房当中的一些小雕、小雕塑、小摆、小摆件和小把件呃，一个特殊的阐释方法啊，跟呃过去已经发表的一些成果之间有一些完全不同的解释啊，并以此联系到一个关于休闲和这个放松的一个主题啊，非常有意思啊，再次感谢。物理系教授，啊，那么今天我们请到了两位年轻的学者来做一个现场的评议和回应。我们先请清华大学的孙金副教授，啊，欢迎Okay, um, many thanks uh, for Professor Lurik's uh, amazing lecture and also uh, thank you very much for Professor Drew's organization of this series of lecture. This is uh, very important for Chinese scholars because it's um, especially in this global um, time that um, Chinese scholars really need to um, have some dialogue with Western um, scholars of art history. And as we know that uh, Professor Zhu have um, dedicated for this goal for many years. And I also appreciate uh, Professor Liu, uh, Professor Li Yang's uh, invitation for me to come here. And um, for myself, I think um, today this uh, lecture is uh, fantastic for um, to be arranged at the first one in this new semester. <laughs> As we know that in current China, there's uh, two popular term, uh, uh, right? We always feel very um, heavy uh, pressure uh, during our study. So I think in the very beginning of this semester, we learned that um, similar situation happened uh, like four or 500 years in Italian Renaissance that 
their scholar also have uh, such kind of uh, problem that uh, when they do some hard work, they also feel kind of uh, uh, depressed and uh, not so happy with um, uh, serious work. Um, then how to find some balance uh, between life and work. So I think today's uh, lecture will give us some um, uh, enlightenment. And um, for myself, um, I uh, personally uh, interested uh, in this topic is because uh, I have done some research on the origin of uh, museums, and I trace back to uh, studio uh, Kunstkammer uh, in Renaissance and um, even uh, late uh, medieval. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, okay. Um, but for my own research, I um, uh, mainly focus on uh, um, uh, micro perspective, for instance, uh, why uh, at that time uh, scholars began to collect, uh, for instance, like um, ancient Greek and Roman uh, statues, uh, their recognitions of uh, ancient civilization, and also um, in the time of uh, the, um, the 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 uh, new world, uh, the the age of exploration, their curiosity of the new world, so they uh, eager to collect some very strange things. And also their um, favor of art that um, change um, the taste of uh, their collection Kunstkammer uh, became Kunstkammer. Uh, but I didn't notice um, all uh, the, the emotion <laughs> of scholars in these studios. So uh, for myself, I'm also very uh, inspired by uh, Professor Rupi's uh, lecture today. And um, so uh, what I want to um, discuss is uh, uh, from this picture, actually uh, in uh, Professor Wuhik's uh, uh, lecture, he already gave us another example of uh, this studio. Uh, this is uh, um, a second uh, studio uh, uh, commissioned by, um, by Duke um, uh, Frederico. Uh, the first one show, uh, I've already showed in your uh, Slides. And this was made in, uh, uh, as we can see, 1478 to 82, made by uh, two craftsmen in Siena and in later installed in, in this palace. And currently it was re it's reserved in uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, we um, may be very impressed by this um, room is because of uh, the fantastic uh, woodworking, right? Uh, because it's uh, very impressive for uh, people at that time how they uh, were um, able to use uh, pieces of wood to create uh, the three-dimensional effect, to create the, um, the, the effect of uh, perspective. Uh, for instance, like here, as we can see in this two-dimensional space, create a three-dimensional um, uh, effect. But if we look at the details of uh, the, the decorations on this wall, we can see, for instance, a lot of collections of uh, uh, books and also musical and uh, uh, marrying instruments. And also we can see the set glass. Um, and as we uh, normally know that sunglass probably is kind of uh, um, instrument to remind people the, the um, past of time, of vanity, et cetera. But it's very interesting to know that today, um, that maybe it also reminds people to have some relax, to, to do something else, right? And also we can see, um, yes, a lot of musical instrument. And another thing uh, I think is also very interesting here uh, is uh, a parrot in a cage, right? But um, why this parrot? Probably it's not strange for us to see a parrot nowadays, but let's imagine that in the 15th century, why a tropical animal appears here? Um, I think it's related to the um, 
scholars' curiosity of the new world. So uh, let's see another uh, prints. Um, this is also a studio um, of a scholar uh, in uh, Naples. Um, his collection, um, as we can see, he must be very proud of his collection. So he commissioned prints to to uh, to depict it. And um, in this painting, we can see a room and um, lots of uh, books. On the right, we can see a bookshelf. And, uh, but more space is reserved for something else. And uh, in the middle, we can see uh, some people. Uh, one of them is the son of this collector. Uh, he is showing his guest of, uh, as we can see, he's pointing, uh, use very long uh, pole to point the animals, a crocodile on the ceiling, and also some other uh, sea animals. <laughs> arranged on the ceiling. And uh, also on the left, we can see on the cupboard, uh, there's um, probably some uh, porcelain uh, imported from China. So as we can see at that time, um, it's kind of a cabinet of uh, curiosities. Scholars want to collect um, things um, uh, to represent nature, and uh, to show their interest to the world and also um, from uh, different places, different parts of the world. And it, that's not only the case happened in the north part, in the south part of, uh, of Europe, but also like this painting, uh, this print um, showing a, a um, physician and naturalist in Denmark. Um, we can see he also collect a lot of uh, um, things. Like here we see a lot of shells and on the left, a lot of different kinds of horns and also on the ceiling um, a specimen of uh, some animals. And in the back, we can see some uh, armor and some sword, etc. cetera. So um, I think he must be very proud of uh, his collection, he might not only do some research about this stuff, but also want to show his understanding of the world. But in the meantime, um, find something interesting to distract himself from the hard work. And um, that also happened uh, in uh, Florence as uh, uh, we can see here uh, a room, uh, a hall of map uh, in uh, Palace uh, uh, Vecchio. Um, this is, um, I think this is very interesting room. It collects uh, 54 maps of the whole world. So that reflects understanding of the world in, in the uh, 16th century. The first, um, so as I know that um, um, this car brought the, the, the front, the, was decorated with map, but inside of this cupboard, it's collection of uh, stuff uh, from different places. For instance, like uh, something probably from China is replaced in the cupboard with the map of China. So um, in the early stage of uh, scholar collection, I mean, uh, um, of, um, is the majority part of the collection. But later on, as we have also seen this uh, picture, that their interest kind of transferred to or switched to uh, works of art. Um, so here we see. Um, the room um, commissioned by uh, Francisco the first um, is a studio, probably a very early example of studio in Florence. It's part office and also part of uh, uh, laboratory and also hiding space for himself to meditate. Um, so we can imagine that in this room, facing all these um, paintings, um, Francisco might can find some peace and uh, pleasure uh, in addition to his very heavy 
work um, with others. Um, and um, so that's why there's another um, series of uh, painting, uh, what we call gallery painting, uh, in uh, became to uh, developed in the beginning of 17th century in Flanders, as we can see here, uh, it's cabinet of collector, but I think maybe it's also a studio or study of some scholar. Uh, as we can see here uh, in the background, uh, there are a lot of paintings, um, of course, some of them are landscape painting, uh, which very important around in the Netherlands, and um, also religious painting, uh, drawing, and in the foreground of this uh, picture, we can see um, also collections of, uh, of nature. We can see some seashells uh, and uh, that reflects um, he, the collectors, uh, the, the ability or his curiosity of the world. And uh, here also we can see another example showing his uh, uh, Nobel Man's collection. Um, and here in the foreground, we can see uh, it's not limited um, again to um, nature, but also more and more painting. And also in the meantime, we can see um, that is also another example to show the um, artistic communication between China and the West. We can see on the for in the foreground, uh, apparently uh, it's a Qing uh, dynasty's uh, blue and white porcelain, and a Ming, Ming dynasty. And also uh, in the middle, we can see a Chinese style lock. Um, so the reason why uh, the artist or the collector want to show such kind of stuff, I think is not only to reflect his taste, but also to, um, to want to show his uh, social status, his wealth, and also um, in the meantime, of course, uh, as we can see in the background, there's a couple, in, in another room, there's uh, a few people uh, getting together to discuss something. So maybe at that time, studio is no longer a very um, <laughs> depressed place, I mean, serious work, uh, but also they can find pleasure, they can find fun, they can have some fun in their room. And um, this round of painting, the gallery painting, uh, I think this is a very uh, uh, interesting example. Uh, we can see it's a um, um, very uh, big room. Uh, it actually shows um, a very uh, important collector in Antwerp. Uh, and he was so proud of uh, his collection, he invited uh, the ruler at that time, uh, Archduke Albert and uh, Isabella, to visit his collection. And he commissioned the artist to depict the scene um, to, uh, to uh, emphasize uh, his, um, or to show his uh, social status. So here we see that he not only collects uh, art of works, and also scientific instruments, as we can see on the table um, on the right and also on the left. And also the wonders of uh, uh, natural world, uh, a lot of flowers, especially the sunflowers, because as we can see here, this is apparently uh, a plant from uh, Africa, from, um, from uh, America. So, that also showed that uh, at that time, um, they, it's kind of uh, symbolic uh, and also uh, allegory uh, to reflect um, his intellectual uh, occupation of the, at that time and also kind of motivation of uh, his personal virtue and also the importance of uh, his good taste. And as we, as I noticed that uh, uh, Professor uh, Ulrich we all gave uh, some lectures on um, uh, Ferdinand uh, Ferdinand Van Hassel's uh, 
work. Uh, this is also very interesting, his depiction of, uh, of the world, his understanding of the world also. So it's also related to um, the scholar's studio at that time, um, and also kind of uh, reflection of their, um, their attitude to life, their attitude to, to the world. And um, with um, all these examples uh, also um, make me very interesting to make a comparison with some Chinese studio. Um, I think this um, reflect the same um, the same problems for all scholars, no matter where they live and uh, when they live. They all want to make their work a serious. They want to pursue of uh, fame, glory, but in the meantime, they also want to find something to make balance of uh, their life and work. So here we see um, a painting made by uh, Liu Songnian showing a scholar uh, who lived in, who studied in uh, a room uh, under a mountain. And uh, he must be very uh, concentrate to his work. He's writing something. But to our interest is that in front of him, we can see here is a uh, screen painting. So we can imagine that when he got tired, he can get up and have a look of this, uh, not only the beautiful scene of nature, but also have a look of this painting. And uh, thanks for uh, Professor Liu Chen's uh, help. Uh, he, she also gave me some images. For instance, here we can see um, a traditional Chinese scholar studio, uh, the first one made by Xu Ying. Uh, it's a copy of uh, uh, Song Dynasty's artist uh, work showing how a scholar uh, in his, uh, lived in his uh, studio. And uh, on the right, we can see a copy of uh, Ding Guanpeng, uh, the one or two. Uh, there are a lot of scholars have done some research about it. But today I want to, uh, we can see from a different perspective, we can see how this studio, how this uh, study is arranged, uh, it's, it's decorated. Uh, for instance, in the background, we can see a very huge uh, painting, uh, not only depicts uh, landscape, mountains and waters, but also a portrait of, uh, of the, the, the owner, the scholar, uh, but here is Qianlong. And on the right, we can also see a lot of stuff, um, antiques and uh, um, something uh, for uh, uh, Chinese scholars to write and to use. And also uh, on the left, in addition to books, there are also some hilarious stuff. So interesting stuff. So um, from these paintings, we can see that for scholars, they not only want to um, make some achievements, uh, academic ch achievements in their studio, but also want to have some fun in their studio. And here also uh, a painting uh, made in the Yuan Dynasty, um, uh, Nizan, uh, Nizan studio. And also there are um, two painting, interesting paintings I want to show here, um, uh, depicts how Emperor Yongzheng uh, he had some fun in his studio. Uh, this painting show he writing uh, Buddhist uh, sutras, but as we can see that he didn't, um, at this moment he is, was not writing, but he um, was looking at something else. Uh, what he's looking at, we can imagine that uh, from the surroundings, for instance, like here on the left, um, there's a uh, rockery. Uh, rockery is very important uh, um, decorations in Chinese garden, right? And uh, it's uh, one of his uh, important function is kind of a miniature landscape. People can uh, walking through the, lands the, the rockeries or looking at the rockeries and imagine themselves uh, walking uh, in the uh, mountains and um, uh, 
to provide them a kind of meditation. And, and on the right, we can, right corner, uh, lower left, we can, uh, lower right, we can also see similar uh, miniature. So maybe during his work of writing, he want to get some rest, get some, to have some relax. And so he looked up uh, out something else. And also we notice in the background, there's also another painting and also uh, uh, a screen and um, a mirror. And he also, in this series of uh, uh, his, his uh, album, uh, there's another one showing him watching, uh, reading books uh, in the studio. And uh, so in the background, we can see on the bookshelf, there are not only books, but also some uh, beautiful vase and antiques. And also on the uh, lower right, we can see there's some tea set uh, and also uh, some food, right? So we can see that he must want to create very comfortable uh, environment that he was not hungry, he was not thirsty, he can drink and he can eat. And of course, he won't feel cold, right? It's very cozy. Um, and also we can see that uh, um, on his chair, uh, there's blankets uh, to make him very comfortable. Um, and so in the end, um, in the end, I want to show you another picture. Uh, do you guys um, know whose office this is? <laughs> Great, yes. Um, I think who can uh, figure out uh, must be very uh, interested in uh, Asian civilization, right? It's Professor Jia Yan's office. Um, as we can see here, I got his, I got her permission, of course. To use the <laughs> to use the picture of uh, her office, um, we see the very uh, cute um, um, cute um, lion, and also uh, there are some plants, and also we can see some uh, doors, and also we can see a cat right on the on the top of the shelf, and. Um, she was very generous to give me more pictures of showing her cat uh, play around in her office. I think this is um, the ideal office for myself. Um, as we can see here, the cat must be very relaxed and um, also uh, the cat can provide a very uh, pleasure uh, environment. We can imagine that uh, whoever uh, in this room um, must could be uh, get a balance uh, between the hard work and also the, the uh, delightful and pleasing um, moods. So um, I think this is a um, um, very excellent uh, example to <laughs> echo this professor's uh, Yuki's uh, the, the lecture showing how a scholar, especially under a certain kind of pressure, pursuit knowledge, curiosity, and also fame or glory, in the meantime, how to keep um, a mind and body healthy. Um, okay, uh, and that's, um, um, that's all I want to uh, discuss with you guys. Thank you very much. Ah,非常感谢孙静教授的一个准备非常充分的一个回应啊，介绍了许多补充了许多新的例子，而且试图证明贾岩教授是一个真正的人文主义者。啊，嗯，好的，那么非常有意思。那么接下来我有请王莹
the School of Art of Peking University. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to Professor Sophister's lecture on such an interesting topic. Professor Sun's commentary is also enlightening. I think work life balance is not an important to Renaissance scholars, but also very important to everybody of all time. Uh, like Professor Sun, this lecture makes me immediately think of scholars' study rooms in, in ancient China. Chinese study rooms also have many furnishings and decorations, as Professor Sun has shown, uh, such as antiques, incense, furnace, paintings, uh, shufa works, gu qin, which is a musical in instrument, vases and uh, real stone. I have brought such a stone here. As you see, it must not be very big, and its shape must be natural and grotesque. Um, though it is chopped and cut, uh, the traces must be invisible. Such bigger stones were used in gardens. These stones reflect that scholars want to be close to nature. Uh, a difference is that erotic scenes never appear in Chinese scholars' study room. Even figure paintings rarely would be rarely penned. Themes of paintings are usually landscape and flower and tree. But traditional Chinese culture put small emphasis on spiritual, uh, on temperance. Scholars are warned not to indulge in material enjoyment and uh, lose the ambitions. There is an essay on humble room without any decoration written by a famous scholar. It says, though it is a humble room, my virtue can make it beautiful. I can play Gu Qin, read Buddhist uh, texts, and chat with learned people. I think that similarities and the differences between ancient Chinese and the Renaissance scholars' study room must be a very interesting topic of comparative culture. Professor Pufistera have talked about melancholy's influence on scholars' health and work. The relationship between mental state and the creativity is a very complex problem in art history. Professor Professor mentioned that melancholy can, may harm scholars' creativity. And Filippo Caponi gave advice on how to increase creativity based on a survey of Michelangelo and Titian. As is well known, Michelangelo worked very hard and suffered serious distress. This damaged his health, but he is one of the most creative men in history. Another famous example is Van Gogh, who committed suicide at 37. There is there are many other examples in art history. So how to explain this? It seems that melancholy almost becomes an impetus for artistic creation. The underlying mental mechanism is also an interesting research topic. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I speak here in Chinese here. 
，呃，我觉得都是很有收获，并且丰富和延伸了这个主题，啊、呃，并且呃，尝试把这个主题的研究从文艺复兴时期与今天，啊、呃，联系起来，啊、呃，就是与中国联系起来，与今天联系起来，啊、呃，非常有意思。呃，那么接下来呢，我们呃，看看给现场的观众、老师、呃，同学。呃，留一个时间，看看是否哪一位老师愿意与这个 Professor w u k i s 这个教授能回应一下啊？哪位老师或同学有有问题？现在可以开放一个时时间啊，包老师啊。Oops. Yeah, for this very rich and thought-provoking. Um, lecture. There are so many themes. I don't know which one to pick. But I'm、uh, as an outsider. I'm curious,、um, partly about the institutional setting.、Um, most of the examples you gave of、um, most of the examples you gave、um, of studios were were in palaces. And、um, so I'm wondering what you know. What's the connection between you know the palaces and the the scholars? Um, did they get stipends? Were were these academies?、Um, that sort of thing. And then,、um, I, and I'm sorry for my ignorance. I should know these things. But、um, related to that is the notion of virtue, which is a very complicated idea. But <clears throat> I'm wondering how that fits into that institutional setting. You you probably you must know James Hankins' work at at Harvard, and and、uh, you know in many of his articles he talks about virtue, and sometimes it's cognate with nobility. And I'm thinking, not all of these scholars were were nobility, right? So, so that's the second half of it.、Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> both very interesting questions, and both help me maybe to explain uh, uh, aspects which I haven't explained uh, uh, enough. The first challenge、uh, in studying these scholar studies is that we have preserved rooms. We have seen other examples, and the preserved rooms are the top rooms made in the 15th and 16th century. And these top rooms were made by the nobility. Whereas we have to imagine that the, I would say, normal study of the most famous humanists were quite humble rooms in their houses or Uh, apartments.、Uh, so this is the problem number first: that the rooms we have preserved are the top nobility things.、Mm -hmm. Then we have a huge amount of objects ranging from very low cost things to super exclusive products、mm -hmm. like the Bellerophon I've shown、mm -hmm. you. And there we have the same problem, plus. The challenge that we do not know where these things really have been. We have、Ooh. to imagine them, and therefore it's so important to show or to、uh, have the, for example, the Lorenzo Lotto portrait, where we can really、uh, tell, oh, this lizard was really put on the desk.、Uh, so we have to imagine all the other animal statues also either on the desk or in some relation to,、mm -hmm. to the desk in this workspace. Uh, so this is the challenge, and maybe、uh, the answer to part one of your question.、Mm -hmm. What we have and what is normally shown is the top uh, uh, are the top products, but we have to imagine that uh, 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 several uh, grades, so to say, of quality. The general problem, I think, remains the same if you're in a humble studio of of a normal scholar and. Uh, or, and if you are in the noble, in a noble study, where the, of course these nobles were not normally not serious scholars, but they play, or it's a kind of representative. Uh, uh, it, it plays a representative function. Like Francesco Primo、mm -hmm. was not uh, uh,、um, uh, an expert in natural sciences,、mm -hmm. but he played or pretended to be this because the the、uh, of course the、uh, the duke has always to be the best. Uh, in all、uh, all disciplines, second aspect is virtue,、mm -hmm. and this is of course a really complicated thing. But 
I think the most important thing is that the 14th and 15th century developed the idea that you can become good by your own, uh, uh, by by by. By your own, mm -hmm. by yeah. your, your work yeah. and your yeah. effort and your behavior, whereas before uh, sure. in the Middle Ages right. in Europe it was by blood. Mm -hmm. You are mm -hmm. were the son of a noble, so you have to be noble. Mm -hmm. Whereas the big change in the 14th century, Petrarch and others, is that mm -hmm. if you really struggle, mm -hmm. you can become a virtuous by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, <clears throat> I think this type of virtuosity is important for all strata of the population as you as you've mentioned uh, the the uh, upper class of course combines nobility of blood and at least pretended to be to, to act also in a virtuous in a virtuous way well thank you very much yeah um I, I would love to make two comments. Thank you very much, because this was exactly the kind of reaction I hoped for, because I'm completely ignorant of the Chinese culture, and I was, but I was very sure that very similar problems, very similar solutions play a crucial role, and it's really interesting for me, and one of the already um, <clears throat> highly interesting things I've realized how common at least certain aspects are in Western early modern culture and in Chinese culture. Maybe we could see your Franz Franken examples again, because I want to point out one, one aspect which seems very interesting. I'm also very grateful that you have moved the topic to the 17th century, which I avoided because I thought I should not uh, uh, talk too much about what I want to do in Hangzhou then. In the next one, we start with the next one, then go back, please. Uh, no, no. Uh, one more, one more, one more. Yeah. <clears throat> this is very, these very interesting uh, objects, um, Chinese objects. However, they have, at least in Western art history, um, there have always been the argument okay, they also collect objects from far away, from Asia, from China, but they only collected non-figural objects because they admired, of course, the porcelain, they admired the ornament. Here they admired the technical uh, sophistication of the lock, but it's not visual figurative because figurative is all European. Mm -hmm. However, and now if you have the other um, Franken. And of course, there were also in, early, in the early modern period, there are voices that say you can admire uh, uh, ornament from Africa, you can admire products from Asia, but as soon as it comes to uh, especially the human figure, you have to look at uh, European art. But if you look at this uh, <laughs> painting by Franken, you, I think you see one of the most spectacular combinations produced in the 17th century, because you see, the Virgin Mary, Christ, and her mother. So the main, the most important topic of Christian Catholic uh, thought combined with fish, mm -hmm. which means that somehow these fish are on an equal level with this drawing. But even more interestingly, it's combined with these uh, Chris from Java, this stagger from Java, and this figure, which for other Europeans is the apogee of the idol. Whereas Franken seems to, the, the message of Franken's painting seems to be, you have to look at all these things under a perspective of curiosity, aesthetics. And if you look closely and without, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, without negative thoughts, you will notice that this drawing is beautiful, but also this dagger and this uh, little figure might be beautiful. And the most important thing here is that Franken combines the left side with this small scene you see here. And these are 
uh, um, donkey-headed people who destroy art. So the message is not that there is Western art and non-Western art, but the argument is there are people who understand art and nature, and there are idiots who destroy everything because they don't look and they don't think. And this seems to me a very interesting and important example that uh, even if there were, of course, voices in the West that say everything outside Europe, per definition, has to be worse than Europe <clears throat> and what uh, Europeans produce, there are also other voices that say you have to look at the things and then you realize that they are interesting and beautiful. And of course, there are always the idiots who don't see this. So thank you very much for this example. Thank you very much. Uh... I think this is probably this meeting uh, uh, further. It's also to be. Uh, uh, Franken. Um, further uh, uh, prove your idea of uh, how uh, some. Um, um, kind of uh, uh, hidden meaning uh, depicted in these paintings, these gallery paintings, is not simply to show the collector's um, taste or his interest, but also here we can apparently see in the background uh, their paintings, and also we can see in the circle uh, apparently is a, um, a religious motif, and. In the on the ground, we can also see another painting is uh, showing the destroy of painting. So the reason why put this painting on the ground is to also here uh, in on the top of uh, the, the the wall, the painting showing um, the uh, final victory of uh, of art, uh, how um, uh, goddess uh, to rescue uh, muses or, or other goddess uh, representing art. Um, so that is also a very interesting uh, painting to show the um, contemporary political and also religious context, as we know that in the end of the uh, um, uh, 16th century in Flanders, uh, there's a fight uh, between the um, different uh, uh, Christianities. Um, so this is also a painting showing how important uh, art is. Uh, how that we need to rescue art, uh, cherish art. Thank you very much. Just, uh, and also, may I have a question? <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed of um, your lecture about uh, Renaissance scholars, uh, how they uh, please themselves, how they, uh, in their studio, they use these uh, small uh, uh, sculptures. Um, I just want to know what happened in uh, medieval time, uh, how scholars at that time probably did not have private studio, how they work in, uh, in the cohort, how they, at that time, in a, a very um, serious religious context, how they uh, managed to relax themselves. I, I don't remember who of you said that uh, relaxing is a kind of anthropological condition of work that you can only work if you also have some free time. I, I very much agree. The, the historical problem is that, at least to my knowledge, we have very little information about the Middle Ages, which does not mean that they have not relaxed, that I, I'm, I'm very sure that they did, but we have very little uh, information um, ab about what they did beyond working. and. Um, also for the Renaissance, it's not surprising that they did other things. However, until now, the aspect that was almost exclusively put to the foreground was this serious side, because of course, as a scholar, you, if we think about what we do, I, I, I guess we all pretend to be serious workers and we put the products we produce to the foreground and uh, I, I'm not sure who is uh, saying, oh, uh, I start my day by, uh, first of all, reading newspaper and then playing uh, around a little bit. And I have really problems in concentrating me on what I should do today. What is really interesting is that 
Um, the first example of a scholar we know of in the West who had a cat in his studio was Petrarch. So uh, also this tradition of living animals uh, or the small lap dog you've seen here seems to become important in the 14th century. Maybe one small comment to what you've said, what I also find very interesting is that you um, have these uh, uh, stone, stones, not only in the garden, but also on kind of presentation uh, uh, podests in your uh, study. This is very interesting because I uh, also the Renaissance uh, studio included natural things, but there we have a difference. The cricket I've shown you on this uh, rich show thing, this cricket was, is, was produced by putting a real dead cricket on this, uh, uh, on this little uh, um, uh, tree. And then when you pour in the hot broth, the small cricket, of course, uh, evaporates. And so it's a kind of live, uh, live cast. Also, the, probably the lizard I've shown you is a live cast. So nature is present in the studio, but normally transfigured, so to say, by, by the, art, uh, by the um, artist. Uh, for uh, the, I haven't commented this northern artist, uh, Jamnitzer. I've just shown you this fantastic uh, writing box with the small animals on it. And this Jamnitzer was also famous for producing flowers in silver by this live cast technique. And the technical virtuosity was that it was so subtle and thin that you won't believe that it's possible to, to produce it by pouring silver into a form. So nature is present, but mostly uh, transformed uh, by, the, uh, by humans. Okay, how? <clears throat> 好,謝謝,呃,Professor,那我們,呃,還有沒有現場的老師的同學要提問?或者回應?嗯,呃,那麼好,那,呃,時間,呃,還有老師要提問嗎?OK,好,好,好,好,好,好,好,好,好,好,
呃倾向，一个是忧郁的，就像我们在呃丢了的作品里面所看到的那个形象，还有一个就是呃忘掉忧郁，忘掉这个烦恼。嗯，比如说像很多的欧洲的传统的这个宫殿行宫。呃，比如说波斯坦的无忧宫，还有法国的很多宫殿，我们都能看到这样的嗯主题。呃，我想请教授给我们解释一下，是不是它确实是两种呃并行不悖的这个传统？我自己觉得很有意思的一点是，好像忧郁显得更加德国一些，然后这个呃欢乐和这个呃。生命的欢乐啊，这种主题似乎更意大利、更法国一些。我不知道这个，嗯，这种感觉是不是对的 ？Yeah, thank you very much. This is also it seems to me a very important question and might even explain why I have chosen that topic because、uh, in German 19th century tradition, it was very obvious that you can only be a scholar if you are one of the serious. Scholars who start at six in the morning and do not stop until eight、uh, in the evening. So、uh, I'm probably struggling with my own.、Um, by the way, we've unfortunately completely lost this、uh, this virtue by now. But、um, even more important, probably, is the the very influential book by Panofsky, Saxe, and Kibansky on melancholy, which you probably all know, and because their general Uh, hypothesis is that around 1500, the quality of melancholy changes from some something negative before 1500 to something still negative, but something that characterizes artists. And it's clear that especially Panofsky came to this result because he、uh, studied Dürer and wanted to interpret this famous uh, print uh, melancholy uh, by Dürer. Uh, so, for, for Panofsky, melancholy became, or me, Panofsky, Saxel, and Kibansky declared melancholy to be a crucial、uh, element,、uh, psychological element of artists and of productivity. I think we have to. This is, of course, not not wrong, but it's not tr completely true, because during the whole 16th century, for example. It's very clear that artists are under the sign of Mercury, and not melancholy, but children of Mercury. Michelangelo's horoscope is a horoscope that sh shows the strong influence of Mercury, which means ingenuity, productivity, which is the absolute opposite of melancholy. And just one more anecdote: we have the、um, we have the receipts for the wine. Michelangelo used during painting the Sistine ceiling, and the quantity is so immense of the wine used during these four years that some、uh, scholars tried to argue that he must have had several assistants because he alone couldn't have drank drank all this、uh, wine. I'm just mentioning this uh, uh, <clears throat> to show that our view of Michelangelo as a melancholic genius has a lot to do with the tradition of art historical interpretation of melancholy. It might not be completely, completely uh, true uh, what what the reality was in the 16th century. So what you say is really important. I think it has to do with German traditions. It has to do with Panofsky, Saxel, and Klebanski's interpretation、uh, as all productive artists as being melancholic. But as I've said, this Caponi. Uh, treaties, I think, is really interesting、uh, because it shows that the sheer fact of writer's block of not being pro as productive as one wants to be was really noticed in the 16th century. It's very interesting because he published it during the lifetime of Titian and Michelangelo, so it's very probable that he was not lying completely because the persons he quoted are still alive. And it's very interesting. For example, what Titian told him: "Within an hour, my mood can completely change. Now, I start in good mood, and then within an hour, I'm completely sterile and cannot produce anything. And it might go back within the next hour. So this is something very fluid. And also, this is unusual for melancholy because melancholy is a psychological state. It's one of the four tempers." So if you are melancholy, you are always melancholic. Whereas what Titian describes is not being 
a melancholic nature, but this is what we all experience. We start in the morning and we have a flow for two hours, and then it stops, or we don't have the flow, and then we can struggle for the whole day and don't produce anything decent, uh, even if we've tried. Okay. Oh, 一个老师或者同学 呃,谢谢大家,那么希望大家能继续关注Professor Fistaha的下一场讲座在上海,在杭州的其他的活动,同样还会有线上的直播,也谢谢线上的各位朋友的这个观看,那么今天的活动就结束了,我们请几位老师上台了,我们做一个合影,maybe we can take a picture together,O